Okay, so this is one of my you know, favorite lectures to do about applications of probability. So this is joint work with Cameron and Kayla. Uh, for those of you who know what Erdős numbers are, Cameron wants to know if stuff like this will get him an Erdős number. Hopefully the answer is eventually yes. Uh, there is a very good chance a nice general math survey article on this will be published in a journal. If anybody is interested in working with me on that, I've already got a startup write-up from a former student. If you want to do that instead of working on a chapter, let me know. You know, again, there's a lot of great mathematics behind here, which is why I want to do this. All right, so the world is rapidly changing. Okay, and people are coming up and do not grab m and All right, so powerful computing is cheaply and readily available. This is very different than when I was a kid. I remember having computers with, you know, four or maybe 16 kilobytes of memory. It would take seven minutes to load a game. Because we have access to all this powerful computing, this changes what we can do. So one of the big questions is, you know, what skills are we teaching? What skills should we be teaching? There is a huge advantage if you know how to do code. So the reason I gave you the tic-tac-toe homework problem leading into today's lecture is to see how difficult it can be to do this theoretically with pen and paper. But if you can write a good exhaustive program to go through the cases, it's not that bad. If you can't do that, you can even simulate the answer and get a really good sense of what's going on. So I want to talk to you today about how to think and attack a new problem, how to see connections, and what data to gather. So frequently, if you know what the answer is, it's much easier to prove that that's correct. The best example of this is proofs by induction. If you want to prove the sum of the integers or the sum of the integers squared, if I give you the formula, then the induction just writes itself. If I ask you, prove that the sum of the fourth powers equals something, well then you've got to think a little bit as what is that formula. There are ways to guess that formula and once you have that formula to refine it and turn it into a proof, but if you don't know that formula at first, it's much harder. If you gather data, you can use that data to get these formulas. We're going to talk a lot about that. Right. So the goal is I want to teach you how to ask questions. Simple questions often lead to good math. We'll gather data, we'll observe, we'll program, as you know I love programming, and we'll simulate. Uh, this is not going to be the first time this semester we use games for mathematics. When was the first time? Basketball. In fact, we're going to see the basketball game is the key to solving the problem today. All right. As always, please interrupt if there are any questions, if there's anything that's not clear. Uh, this is joint work now. Cameron is 8 and 6, but they actually started at 4 and 2 on this. Okay. Um, <coughs> stuff like this is also related to nice math riddles with you know, questions like this. If you are interested in questions like this, let me know. This is another opportunity to try to have you know, broader impact. All right. So by now, everybody should know about the M&M game. Let me briefly review the history of the problem. So when Cam was four, he asked me, if you're born on the same day as someone, if you're laughing at this point, wait till we, oh, it comes next, uh, <laughs> do you die on the same day as someone? I was debating whether or not to say this, but I want to see if I can get you into full chuckles. So how do you answer a question, you know, if you're born on the same day, do you die on the same day to a four-year-old and a two-year-old to explain randomness? One possibility is, well, mommy and Aunt Sarah are identical twins. Here's a 44 mag. No, okay. You're not going to go through and explain to kids that this is a way to, well, look, as a mathematician, that would be a disproof. There would be consequences, okay? So you want to find other socially acceptable ways to explain the notion of randomness, okay? I will not try to make that argument uh, in a court of law, okay? So we came up with the M&M game. This is, I think, from the very first time we played. So this is young Kayla, this is young Cam. Uh, there were negotiations over who got which m ms You could probably figure out what color Kayla liked back then. I, uh, Cam wanted a nice alternating pattern of reds and oranges. I got the leftovers. So everyone starts off with K m ms We did five. And then we all toss a fair coin at the same time. And if you get ahead, you eat your m m If you get a tail, you don't. And you keep playing until you run out of m ms at which point you die. Uh, one of Cam's and Kayla's friends has a grandmother who writes children's stories. And when she heard about this, she actually wanted to use this in one of the children's stories, but she didn't like the morbid you know, phrasing of you eat M&Ms until you die, and she was wondering if there was a way to rephrase this into a happier outcome. Sadly, no, I think death is actually fundamental to this problem, and I am strongly insisting that the original be kept, which is why this is not a children's story today. All right. So what are natural questions to ask? So somebody give me a natural question you can ask about this game. I want, to, I want a string of questions, yes. How many flips will it take till you die on average? How many flips will it take till you die on average? What else could we ask? 
That's the only question you can ask. It's like a, what's a really long life, what's a short life? I'm sorry? What's a long life, what's a short life? What's a long life, what's a short life? You know, would you be very surprised if it took 20 flips, 30 flips, 40 flips as a function of the number of M&Ms? What else could you ask? Based on what you've looked at on this exam, one question should be obvious. What's the probability of a tie as a function of number of M&Ms, number of people? So there's a lot of questions you can ask for this. One of the hardest parts in mathematics is generating new questions. We have techniques to solve them, but trying to find interesting questions. So here's a couple that I listed. How long, I mean, how likely is a tie as a function of k? How long until one dies? I uh, generalize the game, more people. Nobody mentioned this. What if you have a biased coin? You know, maybe you don't want to play too long, so you, know, you give your kids a coin that is going to be like 80% chance of ending up on a heads. So it's important to ask questions. The more questions you ask, the more things you start thinking about, the more chances you have of finding something new and interesting to look at. All right, so here is a histogram plot of the probability of a tie as a function of number of M&Ms. So if you have one M&M, there's a 33% chance of a tie, two M&Ms, 19%, three M&Ms, 14%. All right, so this is assuming just two people playing. We should have roughly 40 people in the class. Does everybody have a partner? Is anybody who's partnerless? All right, so you two will be playing remotely with each other. Okay, ready? So I want you to be playing with your partner right now, and I want to see how long it takes. We've got 40 people. We've got roughly 20 peers. So I would expect roughly about uh, one-fifth, about four ties. All right, ready? All right. Let's go, come on. This is being recorded. This is taking time. Let's play the game. Come on. So I want to know how many games end up in a tie. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. You eat it on heads. Come on. Come on, guys. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Come on, guys. I'm dead You're dead already. Great. All right, is there anybody still going? All right, we have 16 peers in the class right now, 20%, which is one-fifth. So I would predict eh, about um, three or four ties. All right, has everybody finished? How many people? I want one person from each peer that had a tie to raise your hand. One, two, three. Did you get a tie? They're not sure, so they'll count as three and a half. All right. So I said three to four, and we have three to four. All right. Not bad. So the statistics actually bore out pretty well what we should see. Okay. This is the power of statistics. With large numbers of people, it does a fairly good job. And so without even seeing you guys, you know, just assuming you guys would know how to flip a coin and figure out what's a head, what's a tail, which I guess was a little bit hard for some people over here, uh, the prediction of 19% held up pretty well. Now the question, of course, is where do you get these numbers? One of the things you should be good at is trying to extrapolate patterns. When you see this, can you predict what's going to happen if we went up to 40 M&Ms? Is it clear what the pattern is? So anybody want to tell me what they think it would be for 40 M&Ms? Or for 100 or for 200? 5%? All right, so I actually first gave this talk at the 110th anniversary of like the Massachusetts Math Teachers Association. <coughs> and so you know, obviously I had to add in 110, which is below 5%. So we said 40 was about 5%. Not horrible, but it does look like it's a little bit lower. If we want to go all the way up to 220, you know, the next 110 years, not too much. Uh, I'm sorry, I haven't drawn it yet. So the question is, what do we think that would be? Is this easy to look at and see what the limiting behavior will be? You know, to just try to figure out what shape this is going to be. This is not a good curve for us. What's a good curve for us? What kind of shapes do we like? Yes. Normal shapes are actually hard. What's the easiest shape for us to draw? Nope. 
Well, okay, I guess you in some sense uniform is correct, but what, what shape? A line. Whenever possible, we want to draw straight lines. Why? Two points determine a line. Once you have two points, you can draw the line perfectly. You know exactly what's going to happen. With this curve, I don't really know what the functional form is. I'm not quite sure exactly what it's going to be. Is there any way we could possibly get a line from this? So how you present data is important. In stats classes, they sometimes really emphasize this point as to how do you want to visually present data. Any idea of what we could do, what kind of transformation we could do to this data that might make it align? Any rough thoughts as to maybe what the functional form of this might be? Maybe 1 over x, maybe 1 over x squared, maybe 1 over x to a power. Any idea how we could somehow get a line out of that? Yes? Do a log-log transformation. Instead of plotting the probability versus the number of M&Ms, plot the log of the probability versus the log of the number of M&Ms. If the probability is, you know, x to the gamma, where gamma is some exponent, then when you do a log transform, you get the log of the probability is gamma log x, and it will be linear. I understand linear stuff very well. All right, so we're going to gather some data. We'll see patterns. We'll simulate how we show the data matters and which data we show. So again, it was hard to predict what comes next. If we do a log transform, this looks a lot clearer. Does this look like a straight line? I'm sorry? Pretty close. Good. Why are you saying pretty close? It's not quite a straight line. It's not quite a straight line. Where is it bad? Um, early, on. early on. Any thoughts as to why it might not be so good early on? One is discrete. What else? We have comparatively less data points. The limiting behavior hasn't set in. We don't have so much data going on that things have averaged out. If you flip a fair coin a million times and you record the percent heads, do you think that will be a good predictor for the, you know, whether or not the coin is fair? If I flip it a million times? Yes. What if I flip it once? Now, if you flip it once, you're only going to observe 0% or 100% chance of heads. So with small data sets, we don't expect to see the limiting behavior. We expect to see some contamination. If I try to find the best fit line, and we'll talk later uh, next week on the method of least squares as to how you would actually find this best fit line, I'm trying to go through all of these points. And these few points in the beginning are really pulling my line. And so if I do this, the best fit line, I get the following equation. And so it predicts the probability of a tie when k equals 220 is point. 0.1274, or about 1.2%. The actual answer is 1.37%. And so what gives? We've actually talked about what gives. It's not a perfect line. The data in the beginning is contaminating it. Is this a bad prediction? You've got to decide what your scale is. You know, this is a small number. This is a small number. They're close, but look at how they are relative to their actual size. So this is about 12, 13. I'm off by about maybe 1 12th, 1 13th. Maybe about 8%. It's not horrible. You know, ballpark, it's reasonable. It's not the best, but it's not horrible. What do you think we could do to get a better prediction? We could ignore the points early on and take it from the yeah. log Yeah, ig ignore the early points. So let's go from k equals 50 to 110. So if you have really good eyesight, and I apologize for the people who are watching this on video, I don't think the red is going to show up at all. The red basically goes straight through the blue lines, uh, the blue dots. And so now we get you know, a slightly different formula. Um, oops. OK, so we had uh, 1.4 minus 0.54. <coughs> we have 1.58, 0 0.50. So the numbers have changed a little bit. And now we get a prediction of 0.01347. I'm sorry, that's the actual answer. We get 0 0.01344. So just using the data from 50 to 110 to then try to predict what's going on at 220, much further down, we have a really good answer now. You know, we're now missing you know, three parts in basically 1,300 rather than one part in 12 or 13. So again, this is extremely important when you're doing your analysis. You need to figure out which data matters. 
not all data points matter equally. Okay, and so the ones in the beginning I should really not pay as much attention to. One of my favorite problems uh, is involves prime numbers. So a number is prime if it's greater than one, if its only divisors are itself and one. So the primes are two, three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen. There's a lot of questions you can ask about primes. It turns out that in the limit, almost no numbers are prime. And in the limit, almost no numbers start a twin prime pair. So we were talking about twins early today. This gets back to twins. So twin primes differ by two, three and five, five and seven. Here's a strange conjecture. 40% of all integers are prime. 20% of all integers start a twin prime pair. If we look at primes, let's see if the camera swivels. All right, so you'll have to let me know if it's, if it's in range. Let's count all the primes up to 10. So somebody give me the primes up to 10. So 40% of numbers are prime, and 20% start a prime pair. Do you think 40% of all integers are prime? Do you think 20% of all integers start a twin prime pair? All right, let's double the range and go up to 20. What primes do we get if we go from... Uh, 11 to 20. <coughs> 11, 13. All right, 40% again, 20% again. We've doubled the range of computation. Do not calculate from 21 to 40 uh, while I give the rest of the talk. Okay? What's going on? What's going on is it's a small data set. Am I back in range? Excellent. It's a small data set. You would never want to conjecture about primes looking only up to 20. The rate of convergence for a lot of things in primes is roughly log of how high you go up. And so the convergence is so slow, 20 data points is not good. Similarly over here, the question is how many uh, M&Ms do I need before I'm really seeing the limiting behavior? By the time I'm at 50, the data is pretty good. All right. So I'm going to go through the next part very fast. This is just to remind us, because this was from the very first day of class. I want you to see how powerful the geometric series formula is. So this is the game of hoops. Did I use these slides? OK. So you know, Bird and Magic are playing. Bird gets probability p, Magic probability q. We want to know what's the probability that Bird wins. We'll call that x. We break into cases. Bird wins on the first shot, second shot, third shot. We're going to call that eventually r. If, and then we get x is the probability bird wins. It's the infinite sum, or, or just substituting with r. Oh, wow, that's a bad mistake over there. Uh, oh, no, 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 that's fine, because th those r's there. I'm just pulling out the p. OK, good. So this is the geometric series. We talked about viewing this as a memoryless process, where now with x is the probability that bird wins. He wins on his first shot, or he and magic miss. And now it's like we've just reset the game. And this is an extremely important idea. This is used a lot in economics, a lot in mathematics, if you can reduce to a previous state. Sometimes you may not reduce to exactly the same state you started with. And it's one of the reasons I want to review this. This is the easiest possible case where you reduce to the same state you start with. You might have seen this in a calculus class in high school. In Calc 2, when you're doing integration, you have sometimes you have these integrals involving sine or cosine. You integrate by parts twice, and you come back to where you started, but you have a different coefficient in front of it. You bring it over, and maybe you get 3 fourths the integral you want is something that you can do. Then you multiply by 4 thirds, and there's the solution. You know, I call it the bring it over method, because you know, you're bringing it over to the other side. That's essentially what we're doing over here now. So this is now x. We now solve, and we get our geometric series formula. We get the probability that bird wins. Why is this so important? This reduces an infinite calculation to a finite one. So I don't think I really emphasized this too much at the start of the semester. I knew we'd get back to it. I can do finite things a lot better than I can do infinite things. Infinite things are very hard. If you can reduce it to an equivalent finite problem, that's enormous progress. If you have an infinite problem, you're not going to do an infinite sum. Unless you have an exact formula, those are hard to get. You might want to then get some kind of results about how quickly the series is converging. And you can say, well, if I truncate over here, the distribution of these remaining is going to be negligible, and I'll have some bounds as to what my error will be. Oops. OK. And so uh, isolating out the geometric series formula. All right. So here are some lessons that we should have learned from this. The power of perspective. 
If you look at it the right way, if you look at this as a memoryless process, it is a lot easier than doing it as the infinite sum. We can circumvent algebra with a deeper understanding of mathematics. This is a huge theme of this class. What is the best path through the algebra? What's really going on at a fundamental level? Why do things work? The depth of a problem is not always what you would expect. Sometimes problems that seem hard are actually easy or vice versa. The other thing is the importance of knowing more than just the minimum. You can start to see connections between different parts of mathematics. Okay, let's go to the M&M game. So here is the answer. So if we have k M&Ms and two people playing, the probability of a tie is the sum n goes from k to infinity of n minus 1 choose k 1 half to the n minus 1 times a half times n minus 1 choose k minus 1 1 half to the n minus 1 times 1 half where n choose r is the binomial coefficient. All right, that's the answer. This is not too enlightening to see it like this. Also, does this look like an easy or hard sum to evaluate exactly? Hard. Give me two reasons why this is hard. Infinite sum, infinite is bad. What else? Yes. And not only does it have a binomial coefficient squared, the top is changing. It's not just the bottom that's changing. If the bottom was changing, it wouldn't be so bad. Why am I starting the sum at n equals k? Right, n is the number of terms it takes to have a tie. So the stuff over here is the probability that we have a tie with exactly n tosses. So why am I starting in at k? Yeah, we have Cam and M's. You know, no matter how good you know, Cam and Kayla are at tossing, and Kayla still talks about that day she tossed five consecutive heads and died quickly. You know, years later, it was a big moment in her life, or death or whatever. Um, you can't have a tie earlier than that. Now, mathematicians, fortunately, uh, sometimes have nice definitions. And so we actually define n choose k to be 0 if k is greater than n. And using this as a definition, we're actually uh, able to extend this. You can replace this. You know, this is n factorial over um, k factorial n minus k factorial. This is gamma of n plus 1. This is not stuff I did with Cam and Kayla. Of gamma of k plus 1, gamma of n minus k plus 1. It turns out if k is greater than n, you're going to have a gamma of a negative integer down below. And it turns out gamma of a negative integer is infinity. And you will actually get you know, some nice number divided by some nice number divided by infinity, which is 0. If you use the gamma function extension, the natural definition of this should be 0. If you think about what this means, how many ways are there to choose five people from three when order doesn't matter? Well, there should be zero. There should not be any way to choose five people from three. If you know a way to do that, since the Red Sox are about to play a three-game series from the Yankees, I would love us to win five games in that three-game series. Let me know how to do that. Okay, but it should seem nonsensical to be able to talk about doing that. You can't choose five objects from three. The probability of that should be zero. Okay? All right. So, how many of you have ever heard of a hypergeometric function? Am I back in view? Okay. How many of you have ever heard of a hypergeometric function? How many of you have taken differential equations? All right. If you take differential equations, you'll see that a lot of the special functions are actually solutions to families of differential equations where you have different parameters. Hypergeometric equations come up all the time. If you choose special values of the parameters, you get a lot of the common functions you've seen in mathematics. Uh, Professor Strauch in physics and I are thinking about you know, tag teaming, um, teaching a course on special functions, among other things, in two years. Trying to like a WrestleMania style between mathematics and physics. It's amazing how many times these functions come up. It's good to have these on your radar screen. It turns out that the solution of this is the special value of a hypergeometric function at certain points. Again, way beyond what I'm going to be doing with Cam and Kayla. It does, in some sense, reduce the answer of this to the answer to a specific problem. But just because I've reduced the answer to 
a special value does not mean I've made progress. I need a way to compute this. How many of you have heard of Goldbach's problem, writing a number, an even number is the sum of two primes? This is one of the biggest problems in mathematics. Uh, it was conjectured that every large even number can be written as the sum of two primes. Anybody want to conjecture what large means? How big must your number be before you can write it as the sum of two primes, if it's even? Bigger than two, yes. Because you can't write two as the sum of two primes. Once you get to four, the conjecture is it will work. We can now prove every odd number is the sum of three primes. We cannot prove every even number is the sum of two primes. We believe it's true. There is a formula that will tell you whether or not it's true. And so you know, this is going to be a way to introduce some of the math we'll need later when we get to Fourier analysis. So we define e to the i u to be you know, the sum n goes from 0 to infinity, um, i u to the n over n factorial, i is the square root of negative 1. It turns out e to the i u is cosine u plus i sine u. If I let the function fn of x be the sum over all primes less than equal to n, so I'll write primes, of e to the 2 pi i px, if I look at the integral from 0 um, to 1 of fn of x squared, e to the negative 2 pi i 2m x dx, it's 1 if 2m is a sum of 2 primes less than or equal to n and 0 otherwise. And the, yes? Sure, I'll, I'll turn the front light on for a moment. So e to the iu is cosine u plus i sine u. fn of x is the sum of all primes up to n of e to the 2 pi i px. If I look at the integral from 0 to 1 of fn squared e to the negative 2 pi i 2m x dx, this is 1 if, oh, I'm sorry, it's greater than or equal to 1 if 2m is the sum of 2 primes less than or equal to n and 0 otherwise. It actually equals the number of ways of writing 2m as the sum of 2 primes. I'll talk a little bit more when we get into complex analysis why this is the case. But this integral tells me whether or not 2m is the sum of 2 primes. The problem is, this is not an easy integral to evaluate. My function f involves summing an exponential function over primes. We don't know how to do this well enough to do sums of 2 primes. We can do it well enough to do sums of 3 primes. So just because I can write down an answer does not mean I've made progress. Uh, the great Feynman reduced all of physics to one equation. Anybody familiar with Feynman's one equation formulation of all of physics? You, you add all of the physics equations together and get zero, and you subtract them from And square. So Feynman reduced all of physics to u equals zero. And so it's you know, f minus ma squared plus e minus mc squared squared. Basically, take every law of physics where you have an equality, subtract the left from the right-hand side, square it, and add it together. The only way it can equal 0 is if each individual component equals 0. So this is just a very compact way of saying all the laws of physics hold. You reduce all the laws of physics to saying u equals 0. Feynman did this to drive home the point that just because you can write something down concisely does not mean A, you've made progress, or B, that you should do this. You know, it's much less enlightening to talk about u equals 0. Okay? So it's very important to note here oops, uh, that just because we have this formula does not mean that this formula is useful to us. We need to find a way to make this formula useful. Uh, we need to find a way to evaluate hypergeometric functions. Instead of looking at an infinite sum, what would you rather have? A finite sum. Anybody have any ideas how we could make this finite? So the first thing is to try to figure out where do you think this is coming from? Yes?
But, but, but where are these terms coming from? Why do I have this product? Um, so it's the chance that you've gotten B minus one MMs and M minus one tosses, and then times the chance that you get that. Good. So if we want if we want to tie on the nth toss, then on the nth toss, Kim and Kayla must both get ahead. And then in the first n minus one tosses, k must have exactly k minus one heads. Kayla must have exactly k minus one heads. How many ways can you choose k minus one of the n minus one slots? That's where this formula comes from. In some sense, this is very similar to the hypergeometric distribution we looked at. Waiting until you have k minus one successes. I'm sorry, wait until you have k successes. You have to have k minus one successes in the first n minus one, and then end with a success. So. On each turn, one of four things happen. They both eat an M&M. &M. Kim eats an M&M &M and Kayla doesn't. It goes na 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 na. Kayla eats an M&M, &M, but Kim doesn't, or neither eat. Okay. And so the probability of each event is one fourth or twenty-five percent. All right. And so in fact, Kim and Kayla wanted me to bring in uh, representations for them because they can't be here today. And so I have, you know, people to represent Cameron and Kayla. So Cameron and Kayla. Okay. And me. All right. There we go. All right. What's wrong with this? This leads to something that's infinite. Uh, I, I guess one thing that's also wrong with this is that this is, uh, of course, the current Cam and Kayla. We should really go back to when they were younger. So this will be little Cam over here and little Kayla. So what was interesting is I actually bought the uh, Minion little mini packets because this is related to other things we've been talking about in terms of, you know, if you open a prize box, how often do you have to go before you're likely to get each toy? And so, you know, if there's time later today, I will talk more about this. I don't know if any of you have seen these. I bought the little Minion Mini Me packets. They have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Fortunately, the one that Kayla got was the little Agnes. The one Cameron got was the little Gru. They were both very happy, so I did not have to worry about them fighting. But you can actually solve that problem using the same methods we're doing here. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring all this stuff over here. Think about this game. If there's not time to get to it today, think about how we can use the techniques we're going to see today to solve how long must you wait before you have one of each prize, or two of each prize, or whatever. It's the same mathematics, the same type of setup. So here, the probability of each event is one fourth or twenty-five percent. It goes on for infinity. Is there any way you can think of to reduce this to something finite? Yes. Yeah, so we can eliminate the last possibility when neither eat. Okay. And so you know, as I said, this gives us the formula. So we use the lesson from the hoop game. It's memoryless. If neither eats, it's as if it didn't happen. So now there's only three possibilities. Each happens a third of the time. And now instead of having an infinite sum, you now have a finite sum. And goes from 0 to k minus 1. Is this easy to write in a closed form expression? Hell no. It turns out amazingly, um, this expression is a little bit easier to write in a closed form expression because I can relate it to a hypergeometric sum. But if I had to compute something, this is much better. If you tell me now how many M&Ms there are, you, you tell me five M&Ms, I can put this in and I can get the value very quickly for the probability of a tie. So again, this is the power of noting that something is memoryless, is I can reduce it to a simple state and solve the problem. All right, what I want to do now is I want to go through some of the methods of how you might solve it. So again, we've already seen a solution here. I want to show you some other ways. So here's an interpretation. Uh, let's say Cameron has C M and M's and Kayla has K. We'll write it as C K. Why am I using C and K? Cam and Kayla. You want good notation so you can glance down and see what's going on. 
I, as you get more and more complicated problems, as the mathematics becomes more and more involved, you want to be able to quickly glance and see what's happening. So each of the following happens one third of the time. I go from the state CK to C minus 1, K minus 1, or to C minus 1, K, or to C, K minus 1. And I want to flow, and I want to see what's the probability if I start with C and K, that I end up at what? Zero, zero. Did I end up at 0, 0? So here we go. So here is a tree of all the possibilities. I'm starting off here at 4, 4. It was bad enough to do 4, 4 divide 5, 5 would have been painful. And at each point, I have three possibilities. They both eat, just one eats, just the other eats. Um, OK. And so let me make sure I'm going right. All right, so this was both eating, this was just one eating, this was just the other eating. And now I'm going from here to here. Right, okay, so here I've got to be a little bit careful for some of the stuff. Okay, so everything should have three things coming out of it. So here the three things coming out are here, here, and here. Uh, this one over here, 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 and going here that way. And so all I need to do is find what is the probability if I start here that I end up here. What's the probability if I'm in this state that I take this arrow? One third. So what I can do is I put a probability of 1 here, and I see how that flows down. So I'm going to just do it a little bit slowly. You know, it's all here if you want to do the details carefully. I start off with 4, 4, and then one moment later, I have one third of a chance of being here, one third of a chance of being here, one third of a chance of being here. Is there any chance I can ever flow up? No. So I can keep working like this. At the next stage, I see how I flow. This could flow here, this could flow here, and this could flow down. And so if I'm here, you know, I first maybe have these two flow. I increase the probability here, and then I have this flow. And then I can look and see what are my probabilities. The algebra is getting a little painful. What should you use to solve this algebra? How should we solve this? Code, right? You know, I did this by hand. Uh, you should really write a computer program to do this. And you just keep going on, you keep going on, you keep going on. What's nice is if you go, you know, we get down to 1, 1, and we keep going down, we get to 1, 1. Why do I only have to worry about the probability of getting to 1, 1? Yeah, if you, if you want to tie, you've got to go through 1, 1. If somebody has 0 and somebody has an M&M, &M, it can't be a tie. So the only way you can get a tie at 0, 0 is you had to have been at 1, 1 a moment ago. So I only actually have to calculate the probability I land at 1, 1. And so in this case, I get 245 out of 729. All right. So we can interpret the proof, and there's a connection between this and the Fibonacci numbers. So we saw the Fibonacci numbers at the start of the semester. Again, I'm trying to use the end of the semester to review a lot of the concepts we've seen and see how it all ties together. All right, so there's a little video. This is the video I've given you before. Here's Binet's formula. How do we get something like this? Uh, we get it through recurrence relations. Is there a recurrence relation for what we're doing? Yes. Here is the recurrence relation. If x, c, k is the probability of a tie with c and k m and m's, it's one third x, c minus one, k minus one, plus one third c minus one, k, plus one third c, k minus one. This reproduces the tree, but it's a lot cleaner. What's the difference between this and the Fibonacci recurrence? It's two-dimensional. There's two indices. Two indices is a lot harder to deal with, unfortunately, than one index. So there is a lot of pain, uh, sadly, because of this. The other thing is to write this down like this, we had to be clever. We had to notice that if they both got a tail, we could just ignore that. If we don't see that, is it still possible to get a recurrence? So what if we didn't see this? Well, the following recurrence is more natural. Where one fourth of the time nothing happens, one fourth they both eat, one fourth just Cam, one fourth just Kayla. What should you do now? What should we do? Sub subtract off one fourth CK from this side. You'll get three fourths. You multiply both sides by four thirds. And when you do that, there's your occurrence. So if you don't see the clever algebra, you'll actually get it at this point. And then it will suggest in some sense, the memoryless process when you use the bring it over method. You know, here's why that works. Here's where it's coming from. You can see it now arising over here. 
Okay, I love this problem. There is enormous amounts of good mathematics here. If you don't see the memory list at first, you now get it after the fact. I'm going to give you another problem later in the semester. I know that there's much later in the semester left, where initially it's not going to be clear what the answer is. And then after you see the answer, you go, oh, of course, it has to be this. So a lot of times math is like that. Once you see the answer, it's like, of course, yes, I have to do it this way. But before you see the answer, it's not clear. You want to find different ways of approaching problems that make it likely for you to lead to an answer. All right, so here's the recurrence. How do I solve it? Well, if I start off with both of them having no M&Ms, what's the probability of a tie? It's just one. I'm forcing a tie. If Cam starts off with an M&M &M or Kayla and the other one doesn't, probability of a tie is zero. If they each start off with one M&M, I now use my recurrence and I solve it. So now I know x11. And I just keep moving down like this. Now I can do the things where the largest coefficient is a 2. And I get x20, x21, which is the same as x12 by symmetry. And now I can get x22. And so you can use this to march down. And this is a great way, and I strongly urge you to try to do the prize problem like this. Set up a recurrence. You know, if you have two prizes and you want to wait, what's the probability I get? Or, you know, how long do I have to wait till I get you know, one of each prize? How long do I have to wait till I get two of each prizes? You can do it as a recurrence. All right, so try simpler cases. You know, try and find an easier problem and build intuition. So I'm not going to go too much detail into this. I'll just put this over here so you can see the slides. This is very much related to what's called the Catalan numbers, and they have a beautiful recurrence to them. The Catalan numbers are defined as the number of paths on a square grid where you start at the lower left, end at the upper right, and don't cross the main diagonal. So you always stay on it or below it. There's a lot of beautiful relations. You can use generating functions to define it. It's very similar to what we were doing with our recurrence. Here you only have two moves, left and up. What we were doing is a little bit more complicated because there's three moves, but it can be attacked in a similar framework. All right, I'm going to skip this one because of time. I'm going to just list here are the probabilities of a tie. When k is 1, it's a third. 2, it's 5 27ths. 5, it's 1921 over 19,683. Does anybody see any pattern in these numbers? What are all primes? Uh, 245 is not a prime. Anybody see any patterns in the numbers? Yes. They're all odd. Everything seems to be odd. Yep. Any other patterns? Yes. Ah. So it looks like the denominators might be powers of 3. 3, 27, 81. So if we multiply it by 3 to the 2k minus 1, it turns out that always clears the denominators. And you now get the sequence 1, 5, 33, 2, 45, 19, 21, 15,000, blah, 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 blah. Has anybody ever seen the sequence of numbers before? Before I worked on this problem, I had never seen the sequence of numbers before. Everybody I assume knows about Wikipedia. Google, IMDB, OEIS. Congratulations, you've discovered a new website. If you're a mathematician, it's almost as important as some of these other ones. The Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences. Yes, there is an encyclopedia of integer sequences. What you do is you give it a sequence of integers, and it tells you if it has any knowledge of the sequence anywhere. So here's my sequence of integers. I go to the Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences. It's a really easy website to remember, oeis.org. <coughs> Our sequence is A084771. So this is what you would get if you actually go to it. It says it's the coefficients of the following. It's the central coefficient of the following. Uh, the different offsets. It's the number of paths from 0, 0 to n0 using steps 1, 1, 1, 0 and 1 minus 1. You can see very similar to the Catalan. I talked about the three different ways. It gives you a bunch of references. It gives you links. It gives you formulas for them. OK, so it just you know, one set of stuff like that. There's an enormous wealth of information. Remember, we talked at the beginning of the day that if you know a formula, you have a much better chance of being able to prove it. If you have a guess, 
If you have a first few terms, you can actually go to the online encyclopedia, put that in, and it will then give you everything it knows about it. And now when you have some of these guesses as to where it's coming from, you might be able to prove it. You can now try to do proofs by induction. When you know what you're trying to induct on, it's a lot easier. I, uh, takeaways. So always ask questions. There are many ways to solve a problem. Different ways of solving the problem lead to uh, different ways of looking at it and lead to different points about the problem. We saw several different ways of solving the M&M problem. Some of them are more straightforward than others, but they have their own benefits and disadvantages. Experience is a useful and great guide. The more math you see, the more connections you can make. This is one of the reasons why liberal arts college students are valuable, although people don't always see it that way, is you're supposed to have a broad base of knowledge, and you're supposed to be able to make connections between different things. You're going to have to justify to some people why they should hire you over maybe somebody coming from Wharton who has done nothing but take finance classes. Uh, somebody was just telling me uh, they were a uh, chair of a math department that they actually like liberal arts students. They can write papers. They can give talks. They, do, they are not as well prepared. Absolutely not. But they can pick up the facts. Facts can be learned. And so one of the things you should be thinking about in all of your classes is how do I espouse well? How do I write well? How do I present well? What do I want to emphasize? You can learn those facts, okay? Uh, you often don't know where the math will take you. you know, this started off as just, you know, uh, I was on sabbatical at Amherst. My wife had just started teaching at UMass. And I, I don't mind if this is being recorded, the Children's Center there was very bad. And I can document exactly why the Children's Center was, there, was very bad. And I would pick up my kids early every day. And I would try to find different things to do with them you know, before my wife was ready to go home. And so you know, the M&M game became a great way to pass many, many hours, as well as give them a snack. You do not know where the math will go. Uh, there's a lot of great mathematics behind this very simple problem. I used to be involved with the Ross program at Ohio State. Their motto was think deeply on simple things. If you take something very simple and really analyze it, really go into detail, you will often see great mathematics, great connections. Uh, there is a huge value to continuing your education. More math is better. To solve this problem in full detail, hypergeometric functions are coming up. This is a great way to see what's out there and what you might want to use. And now if you read up, I'll put a link on hypergeometric functions, this could be useful in other stuff coming up later. Why do hypergeometric functions arise here? Coefficients of hypergeometric functions involve binomial coefficients. And what we have is products of binomial coefficients. Hypergeometric functions, they turn out to be a really natural, nice way of handling sums like this. It's good to have this on your radar screen. Why probability over statistics? You know, I think they should both be done, but it's the ability to get a closed form expression, to get a parameter dependence. All right, so one of my favorite quotes, which hopefully you've heard me say many times, if all you have is a hammer, pretty soon every problem looks like a nail. I have written a paper in a marketing statistics journal where I use the cookie problem, which we did earlier in the semester, to analyze how rapidly the tail of a series expansion of a Bayesian inference converges. Very few people working in the subject would look at this problem from that perspective. You need to find a place for yourself to make progress. Most of you, no offense, I include myself, are not as smart as the smartest people in the world. And if you try to go one, sorry, you know, if you try to go one on one with them, you're going to lose most of the time. How can you be successful? How can you make a name for yourself? You need to lose your skills in places where other people have not necessarily thought to apply them. Take your technique, take your technique of the hammer and go to the land of the screwdriver. Have a slightly different tool than everybody else has been using. One of the things Feynman talks about in a lot of his stories is people would often give him integrals to evaluate that they couldn't do. And he would look and say, oh, here's the answer. And he'd be amazed that he would do it so quickly. The reason is he said the following, well, look, the people who are giving this to me, they're not morons. They've probably tried all the standard techniques. Most people don't know about differentiating under the integral sign. Let me see if that solves this problem. If it could have been solved with the standard techniques, they wouldn't have brought it to him. So in terms of shining, in terms of making a name for yourself, if, and again, this is one of the advantages of being a liberal arts student, see lots of different areas and try to apply what you're learning in one area to another area where it hasn't been done as much before. All right, I'm not going to go through generating functions right now. I'm just going to quickly 
pause these, put these slides up there so that anybody can now hit pause and see those slides. This is just connecting how you get those formulas. All right.